Perhaps you didn't know, but uh, my father, he is a carpenter. And um, he has uh, said that modernism is a great gift for today's uh, carpenters. Because I think maybe 50% of his jobs used to be fixing especially flat roofs. Oh, right. Because he was like, it's, it's so silly to build flat roofs in, in Norway. Norway. Uh, it's uh, it's strange to build them anywhere, but especially in Norway. And uh, so, because of modernist ideology is designing bad buildings in terms of what nature throws at them, that creates lots of jobs for people fixing those buildings. Yeah. So, th does your father work with building pitch roofs on flat roofs when people realize they don't work? Uh, actually not, because he wants to keep some getting jobs. <laughs> okay. No, so, I'm so just... Uh, that's, uh, <laughs> it could, that's, it uh, could have been a theory. That's a great yeah. business. <laughs> uh, he's actually transforming the, <laughs> the traditional roofs onto flat roofs. Ah, so, right. No. To create more jobs. Th yeah. that, that's a say uh, that only the window makers' children's children throw that much stones. Ah, yeah. Hmm. Because that creates jobs for daddy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. In a way, that's uh, it's very speaking in terms of what needs to be done in terms of quality. And uh, <laughs> I also have a story which it's bizarre in a way. I was quite recently part of a radio show uh, where the radio host wanted us to visit uh, the highest apartment building in Stockholm, which is newly finished. It's called the Northern Towers. And they've been called, not by me, but... Uh, giant turds which they, they look like stacked boxes they're really boring but we talked a lot about quality of the built environment in terms of physical quality when we were there and then we went into the elevator with the radio team and when we were in the elevator the ceiling fell down on us <laughs> <laughs> which was like a bizarre thing i've never experienced that but we were in the elevator and we just talked about how bad the quality has been become within the built environment and that just happened as a receipt of what we were saying mm. so both the, the radio host and the guy holding the microphone he wasn't recording then but we all laughed a lot yeah just oh. because it was such a speaking example of what's going on yeah and just another thing i personally use a lot uh, especially in the stockholm context a good test you can do if a new built house or a building in Stockholm city is you try and park your bike by the street, by that building. And if the steering of the bike goes through the wall, then it's a bad building. <laughs> so you could, you could see on some new buildings that there are holes in the facade from the, st the steerings from bikes because they're so thin and they're just made from like uh, what do you call those? Uh, styrofoam uh, for insulation and then a very thin sheet of plaster. Oh, that's, yeah. So if you can push your finger through the wall, it's probably bad quality. <laughs> that's a bad sign. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and compare that then to houses from the turn of the century, especially in Scandinavian context, that very often has a first floor out of massive granite. You could you can in theory drive your car into it in quite high speed and nothing happens. Mm. The, the reason why I mentioned my, my father is that uh, I, I was just joking that he was uh, doing business out of this, but, but he said that it actually was a business uh, factor. Mm. And, uh, and I think that's, uh, uh, that has some part in why it is difficult to change, because there are several Absolutely. large not yeah. not individual carpenters but there are so large companies that actually make so much from this when when you build a large uh, office buildings of uh, uh, 20 floors and it lasts for only perhaps 15 years be before everything has to be uh, redone, redone. Yeah. that's Big business. It's a great business model to have yeah. to redo the same thing again and again and again. And you, you probably know that happened in, in Oslo, in the newest, hippest area, Bjarvika, around the opera uh, house, which is only ugly, modernistic architecture. 
the first building that was built, an office building in glass, that was built in Björvika, uh, just had to be totally redone. Mm. And that was after, I, I don't know, 12, 15 years. Was that and because was, of bad quality or because of the, the, the environment, the weather has affected it so badly that they had to do it? Really? Uh, it, was, it was bad quality. Yeah, and, and it was more expensive to redo it than to build it. Oh, that's a tragedy. Yeah. And those were probably owned apartments, right? Uh, it was office buildings. Ah, office yeah. buildings. Okay. I've seen, I'm not sure if this is from the same area, but I've seen uh, in, uh, on Facebook in the Norwegian Architecture Uprising an ad for an apartment for sale, probably mm -hmm. in the same area, where clearly the structure, the physical structure of the floor plan and of the building itself was done by one firm and the facade was designed by another firm. So one apartment had these concrete pillars going through, but the windows, the only windows of the apartment was just behind. So you couldn't <laughs> open the windows because there was a great like, concrete pillar yeah. just in front. And that was the only window in every room and it was the same thing for every room. <laughs> so just like, it felt like they would, like, like a game of Tetris. Yeah. You, you just wanted to move that window two meters and that would, that you would have had a great corner for putting a wardrobe or maybe just a chair behind that pillar. That would have been quite nice. Mm. But now you couldn't open the window because the window was fixed to a facade sandwich element that was lifted up with a crane and that window will never be open. Mm. That says a lot about the technology and the methods of constructing as well. Mm. And as you say, I think especially the countries that used to have a program for housing, like the Soviet Union, Sweden, probably more, probably all countries in, to some extent, were in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 70s, especially after the war, they built a machine out of producing apartments for people, like big scale industrial production. Just creating that machinery for that machine that is going to produce those buildings, that costs a lot. But when you're done, you already have everything there. So continue just spitting out new apartments on like a track that costs very little compared to doing things from the ground up. So when you already have all this kind of machinery working, it's very expensive to change. So that's very often why in new production we see standardized sandwich elements with the windows glued in place because there is a factory that produces those why not use it already same thing with these concrete floors that come like they look like uh, the ice cream sandwich like it two, two concrete blocks and then these pipes in between just where you put in installations like electricity or water those also you, you buy them per meter hmm. it, it, it's a product you use for great scale standardized construction. And because those already exist in standardized lengths of six meters wide, long and two meters wide or whatever it is, most buildings are designed for those measurements. So it's like asking, why is your bookshelf so small? Yeah, because I built it out of these parts and those had those measurements. Like, but then why did you build it out of those parts? You can't fit books there. No, but that, that was the cheapest part. Mm. But the, 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 the physical use and the physical size has nothing to do with the finished product's intent. But it was the cheapest material available, so they used it. Yeah. Because they, they could sell the finalized product very expensive anyways. Mm. And when you, <clears throat> when you look at, uh, at traditional classical architecture, so uh, the, the, the point about the roof uh, uh, versus the flat roof is, is just a very easily imaginable example uh, but I think you had a very nice um, very nice anecdote about uh, the plates on the uh, what was it the space uh, spaceship ah, right uh, or not spaceship, no but, but I, I uh, read this and it's it's quite it's more, mostly a joke but it's it's an insight to how lasting regulations are and it's mm. why were the booster rockets on the space shuttles the size they were. And then there's a long explanation that they were made in a factory quite far away. So they had to be transported on railroad. And the railroad passed through a tunnel. 
so they couldn't make it larger than the tunnel. And then you ask, why was the tunnel that size? You had to fit the train carts, of course. But then why do the train carts have that size? Yeah, because the Brits who built the first railroads had that size. And why did they have it? Yeah, because the miners who used the mining carts in the mines had that size, so they just kept doing the same. But then why did they have it? Because they used carts from cart makers. Okay, right, but why did the cart makers do it that size? Because they fitted the roads of England. All right, but why were the roads sized that way? Because the Romans built those roads to fit a Roman chariot, so you could meet. Mm. But then why was the Roman chariot that size? because they wanted to fit two war horses. So one can say the reason why the space shuttle is built the way it is, is because of the width of two horses' asses. Yeah. <laughs> Which just says how long something actually lasts in terms of a standardization. So one has to be very careful when deciding for standards because you never know the impact of those standards. So what I'm saying personally is we should never, in terms of the built environment, standardize anything from anything else than ourselves. Because cities and buildings should be for people. Mm -hmm. So we should always define, measure and standardize our lived spaces and environments after ourselves, the human body. Mm. Because to some extent, we're quite similar as animals everywhere on the planet. So if we just keep to what's natural for us as people, as a human race, then those built environment will be probably quite good because we won't change very much in the future, but we won't have Roman chariots in the future probably. Mm. We don't even know if we're going to use cars. We might fly. Who know? Mm. Yeah, and, I, um, and that, that relates back to, to, to Vitruvius. Yeah, absolutely. Who, uh, uh, yeah, with his 10 books on architecture. And, uh, and I think I've been, um, when I try to philosophize about beauty it's always interesting to read what others have written about it and i think his not definition because he didn't as i know define as a philosopher at all he just uh, not. Um, uh, he wrote down uh, the basics of architecture at that time and um, but his description of beauty venustas that it's found in uh, patterns in nature that you find it in nature and uh, and you can extract uh, patterns from nature to create beauty mm. i think that's one of the simplest but also what i found one of the best not definitions but the best starting points to what beauty is and then you can elaborate on what that means but uh, compared to many other philosophers when beauty was not taken for uh, for granted almost as it was for for centuries when they started trying to define it it becomes so vague and so uh, it's almost like uh, reading philosophers trying to define god it becomes one explanation the one time, another explanation another time. So many definitions of beauty, I think, is like that. Um, but um, not uh, Vitruvius. I think uh, he, is, uh, he has a, at least a very solid starting point. Yeah. Uh, we'll have to come back to Vitruvius because it's so central in this kind of area and subject. But... Uh, would you say that since Vitruvius refers to nature so much in his description of what is beauty, mm. one can also say if nature is a creation of God, then what he is describing is actually like divine. Mm -hmm. So I, I absolutely see what you're referring to in terms of there are similarities to describing beauty and God, because very often beauty is referred to things that are normally referred to as a creation by God. Mm -hmm. So talking about things that are from God or divine or part of the, 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 like the golden creation we all take part of, um, it, it's a very logical and quite natural step to refer to nature as a creation. And uh, 
even say for example if you look at uh, Leonardo da Vinci's interpretation of the Vitruvian man Vitruvius describes proportion not through mathematics but referring to the human body which mm. is also considered in a Christian world being the crown piece of the creation like the, the divine creature and referring to proportion and beauty in the human body and in nature could be quite similar to discussing God, don't mm. you think? Yes. Yeah, I um, I definitely think so, and it's and it's also the the reason why I think it's more uh, concrete in uh, in Vitruvius is that <clears throat> it when referring to nature, it becomes something that can be used in architecture or Absolutely. can be used in uh, in other fields such as painting and sculpture uh, and um, um, of course it's not um, it becomes something else when you define god as nature but uh, i i do see the the similarities i, I wouldn't say you define god as nature but nature as a creation of god mm -hmm. Yeah. and therefore related or referring to God. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. But also these other art forms, because architecture is an art form. Music, poetry, language, painting, sculpture. I, I would agree that if we look at the scale, like the physical size of all these things, like the largest paintings there are could st still fit inside a building. Mm -hmm. Most sculptures could fit a building or they're part of a building as statues or maybe some ornament. Music is very often described, or architecture is very often described as frozen music. Like a musical composition could equally be a composition of a facade. Then the question comes, how do you read it? Where does it start? Where does it end? What way does the melody go? But still, architecture is very often the art form that combines these other arts or other aspects of arts, which I, as an architect, think is uh, <laughs> it, it also something in terms of the lettering. The alphabet starts with A and architecture starts with A. It's like the first, first art form. It's the largest art form, very often also the most expensive art form because built environment is always very expensive compared to a painting or a sculpture or a piece of music. Not always, but I, I think there's beauty in watching architecture as the the little mother who takes place and cares of all other art forms. Like most paintings are either hung or painted inside a building. So mm. in that way, architecture is kind of a defining aspect of other art forms being made. So I do like these kinds of views of how the different art forms work together to create a unity which is often fantastic. Yeah. So what, <clears throat> what are some other main, um, main lessons that you draw from, from Vit Vitruvius as a, as a yeah. classical architect? In, in general, I, I think it, it might be interesting to, to just summon up and see if we, we're on the same track here, because I, I know you're a great fan of Vitruvius as well. Mm. But I think w one major thing which is very interesting, it, we don't really know his full name. This was so long ago, we're not sure if his name was actually Marcus Vitruvius Boyo. It's just a theory. And the only reason this book he wrote still exists is because it was refound in a library in the 1400s. Sadly, without any drawing. It's only the text that's been preserved. So for hundreds of years, especially during the Italian Renaissance, people tried to do depictions of the text. They tried to interpret what he was writing in drawing. I personally think that Palladio did the best work. Salio was also great. Uh, da Vinci did very good things, especially the Vitruvian man. And also other interpretations of the description of the orders, the description of proportion. But one thing that shocked me early when reading Vitruvius is how much of a military man he was. He was in the Roman army as an engineer to construct these ballistic uh, catapults and uh, these uh, great... Uh, almost like bow and arrows, but very big, laying down with wheels on them. I don't know the term in English, but 
how much of these 10 books are actually about technology. So therefore, he describes how to do things in terms of the weather, in terms of drying time. He describes the machinery that lifts the stone. He describes how to place a building in the landscape, how to water a building and remove sewage and uh, uh, how to protect the building from sunlight and rain. So one understands quite fast reading Vitruvius that the architect, which also means master builder, needs to know so many fields, engineering, mechanics, material, geology, uh, weather, uh, water, um, proportion, uh, unity, uh, lots of these things has to be part of it. So it's it, Vitruvius, I think that the reason why that text was so central to, we don't know how central it was to ancient Romans, but we know it was a central part of the new Renaissance, and, and especially in Florence, but in general, it was a central piece of the Renaissance, and it's been around since then. Mm. It's probably the oldest thing we can read about architecture. It, it is. So the reason it's been around for so long, it's, I think, it's because it describes a very simple but still total way of how wide the subject of architecture is and how much you should know in terms of knowledge to be a great architect. So what I take from that is mostly that you realize that what we're doing now with architecture role, is you force the architect to be specialized in one field. And I think that's very wrong. I think architecture education should equally be about mechanics, construction, knowledge of material, knowledge of um, structural, uh, structural construction. You, you should know a little about everything and therefore be the only one in a constructing project who has the full image. Because if you don't, then you put lots of decision and lots of responsibility in the hands of people you don't know if they have the whole picture. And then you'll end up with one of the buildings we just des uh, described, where the facade doesn't even match the interior. Mm. You, you end up with windows that can't be opened because the structure covers them. Th that, that's just it's so clear. You have to know about so many fields. And sadly, today's education doesn't provide that. You don't, you're not given a chance to make out the whole picture. Mm. Yeah. It's, um, um, I'm, um, <clears throat> I, I, I once participated in a, in a course in classical architecture uh, um, in New York, and uh, it was for, uh, by the Institute for Classical Architecture and Art. And, the Classicist. Uh, yes. I love that magazine. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's a great magazine. And, and they had this um, uh, very intense course introduction and and my background is uh, just in philosophy so i i said I'm, I'm really interested and i'm interested in philosophy of architecture but i do not have any background uh, in architecture so uh, the first thing they did was give you paper of good quality a, pa a pen of good quality a yeah. sharpener and they said draw yes of course basically because they know how to educate people yeah but what was interesting was that there was a group of um, we were perhaps uh, 30 people in in that uh, group and all of them were either students of architecture in their late years or uh, practicing archite architects and i was on the same level as them wow. within classical architecture they knew Nothing. And this was, some of them were grown up people of 50 years, maybe 50 years plus. And they didn't know, they knew as little as I did about the columns, about they the didn't orders. They know the basics. No, that was this so strange or, or so sad, actually. Yeah, yeah, but, but yeah. this says it all. These people have spent five, six, seven years in a university teaching or mm. learning, learning yeah. architecture. And then they by chance end up on a proper education mm. and they realized I know nothing and you end up there without I I'm sure you had more knowledge than most just by starting because you've read the classics 
but still you weren't trained as an architect and you felt you were on the same level. Mm. That, that's, it's equally funny as tragic. Yeah, and it, uh, and it made me uh, more certain of what I had heard from uh, classical architects who were upset with how the situation is today and, and how everything is saying that modern, modernist architects don't know anything about about this it's they are talking it down but they don't know what they're talking down mm. and that just convinced me that that is actually the case it's not something that is said uh, for uh, exaggerating or to win the discussion or something like that it's actually a fact yep. and and um, that makes it um, that makes it actually, um, yeah. in In one way, it's it's in one way it's good because then it's it should be easier to to win the discussion and to actually make a change. Um, to have a chance to solve a problem, one has to first acknowledge there is a problem. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm. Th these people in in the class who were educated architects or studying architects were they all from the United States or were they international uh, a few international I don't remember from from what country but okay. uh, mostly mostly American but the United States and to some extent also Canada is probably maybe together with the United Kingdom the countries that actually has a living tradition of classical architecture mm. there, there has been done classical projects in the United States for a long time. I think probably an unbroken line since they gained independence. And in the United Kingdom as well, there's always been this one single project that's kept the flame running. Mm. Um, and in in a Scandinavian context, that's not a case. It's, it's, it's died off completely. And <laughs> I, I remind myself now by using the metaphor of the flame, uh, there's a great quote, uh, I think it's by Sodat, I'm not sure. A tradition is not studying ashes, it's the preservation of fire. Mm. Gustav Mahler? Maybe. Yeah, so, sounds from, yeah, it's probably Mahler. Uh, but I think it's using that term, a lit flame, something that shines light on something. When a fire burns out and you don't even have the glow, it's a great job removing those ashes bringing new firewood and actually lighting it again. But yeah. it's so much easier if there's that one single glowing wooden part and you just add another one and you blow on it and then the fire starts again. Yeah. So it's so important never letting the flame die out. Mm. I'm One of the books that we read there was the, you probably, you obviously know about it, The Builder's Guide to Architecture. Yeah. In 1930. Yeah. yeah it's fantastic. It's probably the last good book on architecture, I would say. Mm. That, that's a very general term, but it's probably the last published book on traditional architecture. I, yeah. I, I have two copies. And, and what, stro uh, what struck me with that book was that it's so, uh, it's very easily understandable and it's very, uh, at least at at the first time you read it, it's yeah. uh, you can of course go in depth very much uh, to it, but it's uh, and and it was made for builders, yeah. carpenters to build in a classical style, yeah. and uh, very um, good instructions on how to do it, and that really shaped a lot of U.S. architecture at that time. I understood, yeah. and I was thinking, you. You mentioned in our talk in the ca uh, in the cave of a palace. You mentioned that your greatest fear is that now, with the architecture uprising, there is a lot of uh, there will probably hopefully be more uh, desire for classical buildings because most uh, political parties are now for classical architecture and. People are starting to get aware of the problem. They want to get traditional architecture built, but they are not educated uh, enough. Around. 
educated architects within that field. Yeah, and the so architects they're, are just they're just the front line of this. We we have a pyramid of people behind that that also needs to be educated. Every everyone from a chimney sweeper to uh, someone working with windows or bricklayers or stonemasons. So it's it's obvious that we need a person to write a new version of the builder's guide to architecture. A, perhaps a Swedish version of that. I, I would Do say you we know would, yeah. who I'm talking about? Ooh, you were doing that. No, I have to be honest and say I have it's no idea. You. Ah, <laughs> I'm going to write that book. Yeah, fantastic. Th- th- thanks for the would weight on my shoulders. Would you be up to up for that? <laughs> to, to be honest, yeah. most Swedes do speak English. Mm-hmm. So there won't be any need for a new translation. Uh, and I guess the rights to publish that book is already out. So you could just order it. But one has to add that that book is mostly based on the American Vignola. Mm-hmm. And it's also based for the, the new British or new world North American tradition. That would not be suitable at all for a Swedish context. So to be honest, I would not like that one to be used for a Swedish market. No, and that was uh, what I was thinking. That okay. we'll, not we'll, yeah. not a Swedish version of that, but, but a, a Swedish uh, uh, a, a book yeah. that was similar to that yeah. uh, in principle, yeah. but applied to uh, at least European, if not Nordic, um, Scandinavian context. Scandinavian context. Yeah, absolutely. That would be gold. And uh, first of all, what, what would that book be called? Mm, a complete guide to classical architecture. Yes, maybe a new guide yeah. to architecture. That would be fantastic. But on this topic, happily, there is lots of books, lots and lots of books, especially old ones. Um, I'm directly thinking about a publication that's done by Löwenkult in the 1850s. Uh, sadly, a tragic story because. He was a great architect in my eyes, but he writes in the foreword of that book that he's ashamed he didn't produce more and he couldn't live from it. And he really wanted to raise the quality of the built environment on the countryside. So most of his drawings in the books you could order from, uh, you, you could buy just the drawing and then build that house. So lots of houses in the Swedish countryside today is based on the Lovenskjöld model. Mm. Fantastic. It's kind of a pattern book. And there are, of course, challenges with these kinds of things, because what you end up, especially in the 1850s, when the Industrial Revolution was already starting, you'll end up with a standardization and houses looking the same in all of the country because they're built from the same drawings. In in theory, I'm actually against this, because I would love every village and every town to have its own kind of built environment. You should celebrate and embrace the local tradition you already have. Because in opposite to what we're seeing today with standardization and globalization within the built environment, sadly, some new office buildings in Stockholm could equally be placed in Tokyo or Madrid. They they just look the same. You you couldn't tell which city you are in in some neighborhoods. The same thing with Oslo, or other European cities. Sadly, so I would argue that th- there is great value in taking care of the local tradition because, especially here in Scandinavia, where the weather is so active, it's very cold, lots of snow. It's quite warm. It could be proper summers. We have harsh east uh, autumns and quite strong springs as well, like four very heavy seasons. And in a Norwegian setting, the sea is actually whipping the landscape. It's quite harsh. In a Swedish setting, there's big and dark forests. There's a coastal area, which is not at all extreme in, in the same way Norway has. So therefore, these natural archetypes deserve their own kind of built setting. I would love if a building from Bergen fits in and looks like a building from Bergen. 
even though you remove it out of context because that means you're producing more of Bergen. That, 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 that's actually an argument I use a lot in the housing crisis, especially in the Stockholm context, when people say it's really attractive to live in central Stockholm, so let's build more. I'm saying, yeah, but it doesn't really matter if it's just more. It has to be more of what people actually crave, what people like, what people demand. So you, you, you'll have to build more of what people actually want. Because if you just add these standardized glass and concrete boxes, you build more in numbers, but you don't build more out of Stockholm. That will only create an even bigger demand for the proper Stockholm built environment, which people already love. And they, they won't pay as much for these new concrete glass boxes in two or five or 10 years, because they realized that's not Stockholm. Same thing goes for every city, I think. And it would be lovely if every town or city at least had the chance to build more of what it, what's already there. Mm. Yeah. And that's also a very strong argument in terms of environmentalness. Things that are built in a way in a certain place is probably built that way because nature forces it to be that way. You're, you're building with nature, you're constructing with nature, not against it. So therefore, most of the materials and the technology produced for building that comes from the local vicinity. It's really hard to get hold of a Spanish brick in Stockholm. It's really hard to get hold of a Swedish granite in Saudi Arabia. And there's no point to use things that you have to transport from all over the world just to build them. <laughs> In, in my hometown, there's a house 100% produced in China. And they moved, the, it's an apartment building. I think it's 10 stories. They put the house on the ship and then they took it from China and they built it again in Sweden. Hmm. I, I, I think th there's probably an economy behind that because Chinese labor is cheaper. Yeah. But, but the whole point of that in every aspect, in terms of environmental friendliness, in terms of culture, in terms of what it actually means for, for that place, it's so bizarre. Yeah. Hmm. But one thing uh, that I think is fun is how you can... Uh, one thing is the vernacular architecture, yeah. which is uh, important to preserve. And it's, uh, as we have talked about, so well adapted to the environment th that are the local environments. But I also f find it uh, exciting and fun how you can mm, use classical architecture, not vernacular, but classical architecture and ma make local um, twists to it. And I would argue that is the vernacular. Yes, uh, but uh, you can definitely say that uh, or I I agree to that, but uh, in a more, uh, how can I say, in a more subtle manner or perhaps more playful manner. Mm. For instance, I, uh, I heard about at one time in the US, they, uh, they changed the top of the uh, Corinthian column. Mm. They changed the leaves that they usually use with tobacco leaves. Fantastic. And that's like, that's... The, the architect really had fun yeah. and I would say the original looked better but it was a try. He, he attempted to do his uh, local twist and uh, create pride in that uh, uh, southern US state that was uh, big on growing tobacco leaves. And another one I saw with corns oh. <laughs> on the top. And, Fantastic. And the, it's, it's just uh, nice to see how you can have so much fun with it. And, and when we drove here, yeah. uh, we saw the, or you pointed out the top of a ionic column that it looked like it, maybe it, it was a, sim, uh, a simplified version. So it could have been the uh, columns of a glass, uh, like um, a glasses store. Probably, yeah. It, yes. it looked very much like glasses, like two round. Yeah. So it, it felt natural that that storefront with those pilasters of it, clearly an Ionian shape. Mm -hmm. But it could, it, it, it looked like it could be a store for glasses. Absolutely. Yeah. My favorite example of this. I'll try to do an experiment with you. Mm -hmm. If you have an Ionian column, what way does the volutes go? 
do with your fingers? Is it that way? Yes. Or is it that way? Yeah. Like curls yes. on the hair. If you do it the other way, yeah. what do you get? Um, I don't know. A boat. Ooh. So in the Stockholm City Hall, yeah. in the Blue Hall, where the noble ceremony is held, some, but not all, of the Ionian capitals are turned upside down into Viking ships with mm. shields on side and a mast going up. Nice. Fantastic. Yeah. So th then you get kind of the, the old story of Stockholm, because it's the city hall of Stockholm mm. since the Vikings. But you add it into, in that case, an extremely beautiful and very refined version of a Swedish grace column. Mm. But you add that small things. And, and the playfulness of ornamentation is almost it, it, it's eternal. Like wherever you go, you learn to see more and more. And as you said, like using the plants from your region in that is fantastic. I, I would argue we're sitting here in two Viking chairs, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if I have, but you have here on the back. Yes. Those are from a classical balustrade. Mm. And we already know that there were Vikings in Constantinople and, and south of Europe working um, either as lifeguards or raiding or whatever. But we know Vikings saw Europe. Vikings saw the world. Uh, if you go to Borgund, my favorite stave church, mm -hmm. and you walk around and you see those colonnades, those are proper like Byzantine columns, but made in wood in year 1000 in Norway. Mm. So lots of the basis we have for vernacular architecture is obviously connected to the Roman or the Greek antiquity style. Mm. Uh, in my region, close to, uh, close to where I'm from, we have the uh, UNESCO World Heritage for the Helsingegård, which is the typical manor house for rich farmers. All of them have columns, all of them have pilasters, some of them have pediments, things that when they were built were probably unheard of in terms of where they came from. People who did those timber buildings had never been to Rome. They had never been to Greece. But there was still some kind of collective memory of how to design things that probably came from some kind of universal values when people traveled around Europe. So all of our vernacular styles, probably in the world, I, I, I would clearly say that even if you look at Korean or Japanese architecture, there are still very clear references to the orders. So yeah. th they're probably a lot older than Egypt. They're probably a lot older than that. There, there, there's the basis of how to build. You stack things and you lay things on top. That's how you create your space. That kind of division between a post and a lintel, that, that's so basic in human construction, that all these two additive elements tend to be universal. And as you say, those, the mix between a vernacular and a classic expression in architecture, I would say that that's what makes vernacular funny because vernacular has to have some extent of classical tradition within it to work at all because otherwise it's just a hut or a shed. Mm. Say for example, the, the, you're Norwegian, so you know this, but the most typical Swedish house there is, how does it look? Uh, well, do you say a yellow cabin no. or red cabin? Very often red, yes. yes. Red cabin, yeah. And that's from Fallen, from the copper mine. The copper color made it red. But what shape does it have? Does it have corners? How, how, how are the windows placed? Like Even really, really old small huts mm -hmm. tend to have a feel for a pilaster on the corner. Yeah. You could see those in, in, in timber construction. You, you, you could see references to, to a colonnade. You could see references to a pediment because it's such a simple shape in nature. It's such a logical way of stacking things. They end up everywhere. Mm. So I, I think to, to some extent, all vernacular has to have a classical basis. And that's also what makes vernacular, in my mind, part of the classical language in contrast to modernist or deconstructivist or brutalist architecture, which 
in, in no extent ha- shares the common ground of the other two. Hmm. I'm, I'm curious about um, uh, what some of the early, early modernists would think today. Because I, uh, as a, I think it's a, a noble philosopher should try to uh, to read his opponent's views uh, in a um, in an open manner and trying to see it in the light. Like, okay, well, what did actually this person uh, strive for? What what did he or she try to uh, to accomplish and to argue for? And if, if you read it, uh, if you read, for instance, uh, uh, Le Corbusier in a friendly manner or in an open manner, he, he expected it to, as I understand him, to rise the quality of living, to, to enhance the quality of living. Because it was, and uh, because at that time it was very, uh, the the rise of uh, socialist democracy and uh, uh, people were not supposed to have this old-fashioned poor quality buildings but have good quality safe uh, buildings and um, um, and a safe upbringing in uh, you have so many square meters with the uh, a grass where you can play and you have these buildings that do not waste time on or energy on any ornamentation because it's just about the quality of living and uh, it he had some ideal behind it hmm. um, do you think he would have had altered his views if he saw how big of a failure it was then one has to take for granted that he would think it is a failure, which probably isn't that obvious. But one can say that the road to hell is very often paved with good intentions. And I thoroughly believe that no one of the early modernists actually wanted anything bad. They had good intentions. They, they did what they thought was best. But the problem starts when they realize that their, their, their view of the world or the, the world they they tried to make better was not the world that was real and it's with Corbusier it's probably very it's very hard uh, my image of him as a person is he was probably very arrogant and very much of a selfish kind of star architect he did everything he could to to become a star and to to be a name in media so in his case as a person I don't believe he would acknowledge anything as a mistake. He would probably be proud of his heritage, uh, mm. at least say it. But there's another example, and that's um, uh, Sven Markelius and Uno Rien, together with Asplund, uh, who wrote probably the most important book in Swedish architecture history. And it's built upon the modernist uh, Uh, books from Siam and also Gideon's Space, Time and Architecture. But this was published in 1930 uh, at the same time at the Stockholm exhibition. And the book is called Accept or Acceptera. And it was a manifest to modernism or to functionalism, as they said. And many years later, I'm not sure when, but probably in the 1950s, they actually begged for forgiveness. They, they said that this was not good and they were naive, they were young and they did not at all expect such an impact from, from the, what they wrote because they felt the impact was really bad and it was harming the society and the built environment, which it obviously was. So one has to be careful with being black or white or writing manifests because Again, back to the space shuttle, you, you don't really know how long the effects of what you do will last. So mm. therefore try to do things that are flexible and will last. Try to build things on what you at least believe are eternal values. But it's, it's a really interesting thought to bring those early modernists back and show, show them the world today. 
yeah, it's it's just mind play, but it's yeah. uh, but, it's, but it's uh, a great thought because th this has to do also with the view we have of them today, and also how would they grade the effects of their own theory in terms of the results we see today. Hmm. I'm not sure, but I don't think they would have been happy. And and I also think it's it's a better way of moving forward. Uh, if you regard a theory or the person, the people behind the theory as uh, failures instead of evil people. Absolutely. Because if you uh, define them as evil people and as uh, uh, opponents, it is easier for people when the time changes to pick those ideas back up. Yeah. But if they are regarded as just that was just a it didn't big work. mistake and yeah. it didn't work, then it's harder to pick it up. It, it, uh, they don't become the marcher. Hmm? That, um, yeah. Th that's a very interesting kind of thought as well in terms of we, we know history tends to repeat itself. Absolutely. Hmm. And I'm, it's... Um, I do think it's hard for, uh, at least it's hard for me to try to imagine how the mindset, the general mindset in the population was, uh, say, mm, say, say a hundred years ago and approximately like that, um, in, in the first early rise of modernism and the period leading up to that. Because there was, in general, among many people, a, uh, a very um, dislike yeah. for the old. And this, this was uh, even before the world wars. Yeah. It was, uh, we, uh, we have a painter in, um, in Norway called Christian Krog, and he was very much into the uh, the um, uh, welfare of the people, especially the poor. And he mm. was uh, uh, very much painting social realistic paintings about uh, how people struggled and how difficult life was, and uh, especially among those with, uh, with less uh, fortune. And he was one of the prime... Uh, he really wanted to tear down the Akershus fortress. Wow. Tear it all down because that old piece of ruin uh, was of no use to the people. And mm. today that is considered as, I think, the most uh, important and one of the most beautiful buildings in Oslo. Uh, or mm. it's not one building, it's a building complex, but it's, uh, I think it's really amazing and beautiful. And, and he was not alone. He was not, a, not a, this one crazy eccentric uh, yeah. painter who wanted something many people agreed with him and it was just by almost a coincidence uh, like one person i think that was central in saving that whole area and that is although that is just an incident i think it shows how the atmosphere developed among the general public regarding the all that it was really a uh, they had managed, or they, uh, someone had managed to make the old, uh, or, or rather to make the new modernistic, uh, functionalistic, be on the same team as the public, speaking the case of the public. Yeah. And I think that's actually one of the uh, success ingredients in the architecture uprising. Yep. That you have managed to get the people on your side. You're speaking the case of the people. Hmm. You're not... Uh, dictating from above. Yes, you're not uh, trying to dictate from above. Th th this is very interesting. I, I myself ha has been thinking a lot about this. How, how the public opinion has been through history. And I've tried to read old newspapers. And especially... <laughs> There's a, one recording from the Swedish radio from the World Expo in Paris in 1925 when they're just doing a sound check. And then there is a Swedish woman screaming at them, Hey, are you guys Swedish? Yeah, okay. I I'm working here in Paris for the moment, but I just have to say, 
please, we can't really bring these boring sugar boxes back to Sweden. This is terrible. We can't build like this. This is from 1925. Oh. And th this is exactly my opinion as well. So <laughs> throughout the architecture uprising as a movement, we realized that there, there, there's lots and lots of small newspaper articles or just funny like, comic strips or letters or complaints about early modernism from, from the Swedish people. People in general did not like this at all. And then I thought, how did it sound 100 years earlier? Sadly, there's not very much written in terms of public opinion about buildings. There is some, but it's n not as rich. But my belief is that it's always been kind of a universal perspective into what beauty is. Then there's been trends throughout history on exactly how and, and those fine-tuning things, but all has been done within what's considered the classical umbrella. But what happens with the modernism, the, the, the modernism stepping in is probably the most extreme cut in a tradition in how we build ever, at least so far, because it changes so much, it's so rational, it's so hard. But I think one reason especially here in Scandinavia, why this built style was so fast and so easily approved by the people is because it was simultaneous with the social democratic rebuilding of society, what is called in Swedish the people's home, Folkhemmet, because that actually meant physical better standards. People could have bathtubs and hot water in the tab and maybe electric lights. And before that they had like outhouses and they didn't have running water in their houses. But that has nothing to do with the style of the building. That's only technical installation. Hmm. Most classical buildings have running water and switch. So I, I think th there's also a very clear idea of the socialist idea or maybe the social democratic idea of how to rebuild a society that the, 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 the new and the fresh and the bright home of the worker uh, should just be valued higher than everything else. Like these old palaces in the city center, they just they scream bourgeoisie. They're, they're, they're an, an old relic of the old world that speaks to right politics or liberal politics. And we should just get rid of them and start a new world, which is qu quite similar to what the modernist ideology is all about. Mm -hmm. So I think in a Scandinavian context, a lot has to do with the social democratic movement, uh, how the standard of living actually exploded in terms of better quality, together with its functionalistic style. So in my heart, I don't believe people hated these buildings because how they looked, but rather what they represented in contrast to what they were trying to do at the moment. Yeah. But then it was also, uh, there, there were so many examples, though, of people who really didn't like what was happening. Yeah. Uh, I, I remember I, I was sitting at a bar uh, and I overheard uh, an older person talking about his childhood when he was moved from one of these working class yeah. places, Enerhaun, in Oslo, which was this, when we see it today, this beautiful... Uh, uh, neighborhood with uh, with small streets and small buildings Pitalesque. and uh, yes yeah. very uh, and very Pitalesque. homely yes and they tore every everything down and replaced it with six or eight uh, concrete boxes uh, really large concrete boxes like domino uh, yeah. pieces and um, and that was and he said my mom said that we would have a much better life when we moved to the, that suburb uh, place. And, uh, but he said, but I didn't want to move. And they had to drag me out. They came from the government and they mm. dragged me out of my home. And I was uh, holding tight in the, to the door and mm. they had to drag me out because this was my home and I really loved it here. And he said, uh, everyone used to play in the streets, all the kids and everything. And yes, they got so much better um, more facilities meters. and square meters. Every, Central heating. But he said it was not the same and it was way worse. No one played in the 
uh, in the garden. parking lot. Yes, in the parking lot and uh, yeah. and everything. And and also we we have some areas uh, Vika that was torn down in Oslo because they were building the city hall and some other yeah. uh, buildings. And um, you can see in so many flea markets or other uh, auction houses, you see paintings from the old Vika because it was announced for a very long time that this will be torn down. Mm. And, uh, and painters uh, who were nostalgic and sentimental, they came and painted this that they knew would be lost very soon. Mm. So although the general public knew that, or they were told that this is improvement, there was very much resistance too, but they weren't heard, I think. I would say this is a very central part of what Architecture Uprising is. Uh, th this is a national tragedy in lots of countries. Uh, in Stockholm, they talk about the demolition of Clara. Mm. And it's said that Gothenburg is the most demolished city in Europe. There's an anecdote of an American tourist visiting Stockholm after the war, looking around and asking a local, was Stockholm bombed by Germans or Russians? And the Stockholmer said, oh, this, no, we did it all by ourselves. Mm. And this has truly been a tragedy, uh, something, a collective trauma for lots of people. And, and what I think is really interesting, it's, how you can inherit some trauma you were never a part of. I, I know in Berlin, when they had a debate of how to rebuild or if to rebuild the city castle, lots of young people who weren't even born when the castle was there, they weren't even born when the ruins were torn down, said they missed it. But they weren't even born. Mm. But through collective memory as Berliners, They've seen pictures, they've heard stories. They knew and has always knew, known that th this used to be. And, and th this is so e effective uh, as a tool in our fight for our cause as well. When we show pictures of this is how it used to be and this is how it is. And, and that contrast is extreme and it, it fuels so many feelings in people, especially it's so interesting to see those feelings in people who weren't even born when these buildings were demolished. So I, I think there, there's beauty and it also proves kind of my theory of there is a universal kind of appreciation for beauty. And there's probably also a universal or at least collective memory of things that used to be beauty. So in a way, lots of people in our movement do remember these places and they fight for especially the same thing not happening again. We have to stand guard and protect what we already have, but making sure that we don't do the same mistakes again. But hopefully what we build today will be a better city for all of our collective memories. <laughs>